My name is Arthur Flug. I'm the uh, executive director of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, and this is the 15th time we are having a presentation such as we're having today. Uh, seven and a half years ago, speaking loud, I know. Seven and a half years ago, I was approached by a group of Holocaust survivors uh, and they said, we have a problem and uh, we're getting older and we want you to do something about it. And I said, well, I'm getting older too and I'd like to do something about it. <coughs> and they said, no, we're not afraid of what you're referring to. We are worried that what happened to us will be forgotten. <coughs> we want you to help us have our stories remembered and we'd like you to do it now. And I said, well, give me about two weeks time when we meet again, uh, because we meet here every Friday, every two weeks. And I said, I'll have an idea. <coughs> and after speaking to some people on staff, we came up with the idea of having an internship program where students such as yourself <coughs> would come meet with me and we would go ahead and study about the Holocaust. And then when I thought you were ready, I would instruct you on how to interview Holocaust survivors. And then I would hook you up with Holocaust survivors. And your responsibility would be not only to listen to their story and document it, your responsibility would be to tell their story to friends, to other teachers, to people in your family. It has worked out amazingly well. <clears throat> it has worked out so well that when the first class of interns that we had at the college, I had four interns. And I got those interns by standing in front of the student cafeteria and saying, hey, interest in internship? We got it, and we talk about it. I got four interns. Th three years ago, we began to notice an uptick in students wanting to become interns at the Kupferberg Center. And last year, for the first time, we had the same problem this year. And it's one of those wonderful problems you love to have. We had a waiting list for people who wanted to become interns. You can't get a better endorsement than that from students. In fact, we had some of our students would come in and say, I'm taking this internship and if I get it, can I interview Hanny Liebman? Okay? Can I interview Ethel Katz? Can I interview Hannah Deutsch? And all the others, they had told such amazing stories that the students began transmitting the news about, listen, if you meet with this woman, you're going to hear a story that's really going to amaze you. And so we have students coming in saying, can you hook me up with so-and-so? That's the person I want to interview. This year, we were very, very fortunate, and I consider myself extremely fortunate because we finally, CUNY said, Arthur, we're giving you an assistant. And I had, after two years, an assistant director, Marissa Berman, who has an amazing background in documenting historical things. And Marissa took over the internship for this semester, and she is going to be working with you. We have some people here that I want to introduce to you because you're going to find out most of the elected officials have a very, very busy schedule. They always have to be two places at the same time. And whenever they said they're coming, they say, I can come at 12.05, I have to be out at 12.20 because I have to be 10 blocks away. And so we're delighted to have them here. I'd like to introduce them one at a time, uh, Assembly, uh, City Councilman Mark Weprin. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I actually was hoping to stick around a few minutes because this is always an amazing ceremony. Uh, ladies, you're like rock stars, I see. Uh, you know, everyone. Uh, wants to know you. Uh, first, I, I got to compliment Arthur Flug and the job he does here. And Marissa has been a great addition. Um, the Holocaust Resource Center, the Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center, is such a unique place for us in Queens. And, and you know, New York City schools are required to teach about the Holocaust now. 
uh, to teach about other oppressions. And, and Arthur has done a great job of not only, and if you look around this room, you'll see it, of not only talking about the Holocaust and what went on in, during World War II, but also other, other uh, people who have been oppressed around the world and continue to be oppressed. Because you know we're all God's children, and that's what's so powerful about the stories these ladies tell uh, to, to anyone. And that you have a diverse group of interns who come and hear a story, and it, it could be them. And uh, you know that's the power of uh, telling this story, because it is such a horrendous story, but it's unbelievable in our society here in America today. But the whole point of the Holocaust Center was so that we don't forget and that we watch for this in the future and to make sure that other people don't suffer the way these ladies did and so many other you know, people who suffered during the Holocaust, not to mention the six million Jews who were killed, but so many other people as well, and then all the people who just suffered under the Holocaust, whether in ghettos or other places. Um, so th I, I, this is a great center, and it's such an educational place. It's a beautiful place, and the administration of the Queensborough Community College has been phenomenal, and uh, Dr. Call and all her staff have, have been great. Dr. Marti, who was here before, really was the, the father of, of, of this resource center uh, by, by, by really making sure it came to fruition. So we're so happy, and this intern program, um, you know, is the, hear the stories coming from the mouths of these young people really brings it home and it is a very emotional ceremony. So I'm going to try to stick around because it's one of these things, I, I like to think this internship program has been life changing for these in interns where you hear a story and it just changes the way you look at life and how you appreciate your own life and what we have. And we need to do that, but also to make sure to stay together that we watch out for people uh, all around the world, whether it's Darfur or anywhere else, who are being oppressed. Um, to realize that you know we all need to stick together as a human race and to try to eradicate these type of situations when 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 someone comes in trying to do this. So I just want to compliment everyone in the room for participating in this and for having me here today. And uh, I congratulate the interns on a job well done. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. And uh, thank you, Arthur, for having me here today. Mark, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Marissa. And another good friend that I'd like to introduce is Councilman Leroy Comrie. Councilman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to stop by this afternoon to, to witness the ceremony, to hear uh, from the interns of their perspective on the things that they've learned. Uh, you know, sharing history and, and sharing um, what happened uh, during uh, the Holocaust, sharing what happened and transmitting um, to another generation, you know, those stories is important because we need to make sure that it never happens again, that we never create that kind of atmosphere where we try to uh, as, uh, utilize the power of a nation to oppress people, where we utilize the, the desire to take over a, a world to, to find reasons to find um, an idea that someone is better than someone or someone should be uh, treated lesser than equal. So it's important that our interns here is that young people get to hear these stories um, of what happened that we, um, you know, as Mark said, the, the wonderful work that's going on here at the Holocaust Center where you're not just working on one level of oppression but reminding people that there's still oppression in the world today. You know, there's still um, people that are trying to enslave people. There's still uh, people that are trying to put people in uh, levels of oppression. Uh, we need to be vigilant about it and we need to remind people that exist. And I just wanted to come by and, and thank Arthur and thank now Marissa who is there and who's been, who's gonna be a great addition uh, to the Holocaust Museum here to try to make sure that we get out a, a message of understanding um, for people so that we can never face this type of uh, hate again, that we can never face this type of desire to make anyone lesser than anyone else. So uh, I'm pleased to be here today. And I got a little bit of time. I'm going to stay for the ceremony as well. So thank you. OK, thank you. And one, one other person I'd like to introduce, uh, Councilman Steve Israel, uh, not Councilman, Congressman Steve Israel. Uh, has sort of a newcomer to Queens when districts have changed, part of his district now involved in Queens. And he called me last week to say, uh, I had to choose between you and a vote in the U.S. Congress. So you know who won. 
And, but he said, I would like to send someone there. And he has sent one of his representatives, Harrison Foy. I'd like you to come up, Harrison. And just if you'd like to say a few words on behalf of, of, the, of the congressman. Thank you for having me. I've been here, uh, I think, two times now since I've been working for the congressman. It's a great place. It's a great resource in the district. And we're very thankful that people here are looking to preserve a very important part of our history and make sure that it spreads to the next generations and is never forgotten. So thank you for your service. Thank you for preserving this important history. And thank you for having me today. Harrison, thank you so much. That's very nice to you. Now, one thing, this is not an official meeting unless we take a picture. Okay, so I'd like all the interns to come forward, and I'd like our honored guests to come forward. There's one other person that I want to introduce, uh, <coughs> but I'd like to tell something about this person. <coughs> when I introduce Mark Wepper, and most of you know him, he's a very active councilman in this district, and the same with uh, Councilman Comrie. But the reason we can do all these things at the Holocaust Center is because there are people in our community, in Queens and beyond, who have recognized what we do and recognize it is important. And they have provided us with the financial resources to continue this program for the past several years and hopefully into the next several years. One of these is an organization that I don't think anybody here is familiar with. It's not in Queens, it's in Manhattan. It's called Temple Emanuel. It is on Fifth Avenue and 65th Street, and we are so lucky, and I'd like to introduce Jocelyn Chait, a member of the temple, who has been our champion and our spokesman, and she has consistently seen to it that we get the financial resources, and we thank you so much for doing that. We, we really do. We'd like to yeah. see our, our tax dollars at good work. Okay, <laughs> ha having said that, let me introduce Marissa Berman, the assistant director, who is in charge of this year's internship. Great, thank you. All right, well, welcome everyone to the spring 2013 Holocaust internship final presentation. Uh, this year we had nine students that participated in our program, and I'm very proud of all of the, the hard work that they did to learn about the Jewish experience during uh, World War II in Europe. I want to thank Dr. Flug for giving me the opportunity to lead this internship program this year. It was really exciting for me. It was a wonderful experience. And I also want to thank him for bringing me on board and also um, Vice President of Institutional Advancement, Rosemary Zins, and of course the President of the college, Dr. Diane Call, for bringing me to QCC. I absolutely love it here and I've had such a great experience so far. The Holocaust is not an easy subject to learn about or to teach about. And as my interns will tell you, I tried to bring candy almost every time we met. And the, the thought process behind that was to bring them a little bit of sweetness to kind of help take that bitter taste out of your mouth from learning about this topic. And I, I hope it helped. I, I think it did. I don't know if I combine now you're going to think of the Holocaust or you think of candy. But I'm really proud of all the students accomplished this semester. And I'm really excited to hear firsthand what their experience was like. So just to recap for what the program is, it's a highly competitive internship program. And the students that were accepted would meet with me for an hour a week for 12 weeks. And they got an intensive history of the Holocaust. And the, the program would culminate with them being assigned an, an actual Holocaust survivor and they would interview them one-on-one, -on -one, and then they would come today to an event and, and share the story of their survivor and share their experience. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna call each student up one by one with their survivor. Um, unfortunately, a few survivors weren't able to make it today, so we'll have the students speak on their own, but I'm really excited for, to hear everything they have to say. So we're gonna actually start with intern Husni, who was with Hanny Liebman. So if you guys want to come up, I just want to introduce him a little. I really enjoyed working with, with Hosni. Um, he was an active participant in the program, and he always spoke his mind, and he always had something really interesting to say, especially when it came to making up fictitious religions. He always had a lot. Um, yes, it's a long story. <laughs> so he is an outstanding writer, and he actually received an honorable mention this semester in the Historical Society of the New York Courts Garfunkel Essay Contest for his essay on surveillance, drones, and privacy rights. And he expressed an interest in learning about the camp, so we decided to pair him with our survivor, Hanny Liebman. I don't know where to start over here. Kind of <laughs> awkward. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Hanny and her story? When I first met her, 
I did not think too much, to be honest. Like, I just thought, oh, I'm sorry. I did not think too much. I just thought to myself, you know, I want to hear her story. I don't want to expect too much. I don't want to assume anything. Um, from what I've heard, you know, within the sessions that we've taken, um, you know, a lot of people have or went through a lot of um, crazy things that we don't picture ourselves going through in any way, form, or possible. So after I got to meet her and I spoke with her a little bit, the events that took place during her time, from the moment she was a young child all the way until the uh, World War II ended, was something straight out of a movie. I could not picture myself going through it. I could not picture anybody going through something like that. And the fact that she actually went through it and came out of it and became stronger from it was something that I really admired and envied and wished that everybody, every one of us, would actually acknowledge and put into our daily lives and realize that you know, people went through these. These aren't just things that happen in movies or games or anything like that. This is real life events that took place at one moment or another. She is a very strong person, I gotta say that for sure. And she's humble, I gotta say. She's the most <laughs> humble person I've spoken to. Um, I did not write a reflection paper more based on my emotions towards you know speaking with her about her story. I tried my best. I don't want to say I did it to exactly the way she liked it or the way it was supposed to be, <laughs> but I tried my best to retell her story um, so everybody gets an idea of how or what she's been through within the time period of when it all began up until the time it finished. And hopefully you guys will enjoy the story. Um, in the many times before the war, there was chaos, there was chaos roaming the streets. A worldwide depression occurred, leaving many stranded and without options but to commit actions they wouldn't have committed otherwise. Fights in the streets occurring on a regular basis, people starving in the streets who have not eaten in days, too weak to pick themselves up <coughs> to get what they need. In Germany, this was the norm of many time and as bad as it was, I wish, um, as bad as it was, I learned, I would learn through time that it would only get worse before anything got better. In 1928 in Europe, I was only about 14 years of age. like four. Oh, I'm sorry, four. As I said, it's not 100% to the life. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I did everything that an average child would do in those times, like go to school and play with my friends. Things were normal, although there was much violence revolving in the streets for those who were hungry or discriminated against the Jews. Fortunately, my father, my father, who passed away when I was only three months old, left my mother and I with a well-established business on the first floor of the building we lived in. The business helped us maintain a middle-class status during the time of the Depression, and if not for it, my mother's determination, if not for it and my mother's determination to keep it running efficiently, the outcome might have been different. As, as time passed, and Hitler grew into power, I started noticing much difference in the way the world viewed us, the Jewish people. Uh, laws were being placed to discriminate me and those like me for being born and raised believing in the Jewish religion. My fr a friend of mine from Yugoslavia once told me that in a dictatorship, a person is never free, always to follow the, bu uh, the beat of the drum. I did not understand this concept at first, but as time passed and laws were being placed to segregate the Jews, from the rest of the Gentile population, I began to understand what she meant. The Jewish people as a whole were not allowed to be in public schools with the Gentiles and were segregated into schools of their own. Those in public schools were placed in racial classes that instilled the thoughts of Jews being less than people and even considered to be, to be the rats of the German population, which changed the perception of those I once called friends, leaving me to be shunned by the German community where I was born and bred. I saw slander in every way possible, advertisements, radios, withholding telephones, and laws made to prevent Jewish people from ever succeeding. I did not believe any of what, I was, being, uh, any of what was being said. I knew who I was and was chained to reality by the soft-spoken words of my mother. My mother was a musician with a strong spirit. She believed in truth and often explained to me of that which I did not understand. Together, after I finished school, for the day, we ran the family business, and after closing, we'd go to the apartment right above. We had each other as company, and she would tell me stories of my father, who passed away when I was three months old. Jose, I'm just going to interrupt you there, because I know her story is, it's, it'll be a long story, and there's a lot of details, and I know how, how thorough of a writer you are, and how much you want to say, but, yeah. So, 
Okay. Can you tell me what do you think is the most significant thing that you learned from her story? And I know her story, and it's it's very powerful. But for people that that haven't heard it, if you could summarize it, what do you, what do you think you would say? The most significant thing I've gotten out of her entire story, which is something that my father has said to me countless times, but I've never understood, actually really never understood, I've just taken to be count like uh, meaningless words, was to stay true of who you are. Understand who you are, don't be afraid of it, don't deny it, don't reject it. Believe who you are, understand who you are, accept who you are, and love who you are. If you're unable to do that, then there's no possible way that others will love you and respect you. For it's respect for yourself that brings others to respect you. And that's one of the main reasons that I respect Hanny so much is because of everything she dealt with, she was able to maintain her identity in those times of crisis, which is something I doubt I would be able to do, to be honest. Yeah. Hanny, let me ask you a question. You, you've been through this every time we've had this, okay? And you've met all these uh, young students coming in. What was your opinion of your current intern? Yeah, I mean, he, he's, been in, he's been given a job to remember you. What do you remember about your... I will remember him as an extremely sensitive young man. And I don't know, he wants to go into what? Criminal justice? Law. Yeah. <laughs> Law. Good. <laughs> you won't stay long in the police force because you're not made for that. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Great, and you know what I'll do, since I know how important writing is, I'll make sure that your full paper is posted on our website, that way everyone can see it and we can hear the No, story. he's really a very sensitive young man, and he did very well. Thank you. That's a, that's yeah. a lot, remember, she has very high standards. I know. <laughs> All right, great, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Okay. One of you. Okay, great. So. I want to introduce another person who has really been not only a supporter but a champion of what we do here, and that's State Senator Toby Stavisky. Faces here. I was just here the other uh, day for your graduation. Um, <clears throat> As I look around the room and you see the other examples of really genocide and uh, holocausts, I think back to the days when, as a high school teacher, we taught these subjects and how different it is today for students to actually meet people who experienced these atrocities firsthand because it makes it it, it, it pales in comparison to to yes reading about it quite frankly uh, and then you come and you it gives a face to a concept and I think that is extremely important and for that we are grateful to uh, to Queensboro for setting the standard for offering these programs to remind us of the future so that we're not doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. So I congratulate the students um, and uh, uh, particularly though Queensboro has been at the forefront and I think Queensboro is just a great, great college. There are so many areas, I, I guess uh, Arthur and Rosemary, you just do such a good job and it is appreciated. Sometimes it can be uh, frustrating, sometimes it can be harrowing, and yet you do this mission so well. Uh, so again, I thank you, and I do have certificates for, uh, should, I, should I give them to you? Or? Yeah, give them to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have certificates for everybody, and uh, again, we, we thank you, and uh, um, let me make one other point, because I think it's important. When Senator Lautenberg just passed away, 
from New Jersey, and he was the last World War II veteran. And I think to the Holocaust, as we have fewer and fewer people who lived through it, it becomes more and more important to tell the story to future generations. And I think that's really the significance of your program today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next intern will be um, Chajin Dong Ross. Okay, Lena. And uh, Ross is what, with Sam Wodarski. All right. So as they come up, let me just introduce him a little. Um, Ross is studying business administration here at the college. And he actually became familiar with, Hello. how are you, with the center uh, last summer. He came here with one of his classes. And it was then that he first became interested in learning about the Holocaust. And he was a very, he's a very active participant in the college. He's actually voted treasurer of the student government for uh, this semester. And he is from China. And he holds a particular interest in World War II due to events that have happened in, in China, like the Rape of Nanking. And he expressed an interest in learning more about concentration camps. So we decided to pair him with survivor Sam Wadowski. And I'd like to thank Ms. Uh, Ms. Berman to be, with, to be meeting with us every Friday. A wonderful, gorgeous woman. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, and the first time I met uh, Mr. Widowski was last Sunday when I interviewed him. And I knocked the door. The one who opened the door was a young man. And I thought the celebrity was so young. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, his son, he's the his third son. He has three sons now and six grandchildren. A happy, a happy family. And, And as Congress, Congressman said, this internship program is really a life-changing experience. My smartphone was, uh, was taken by Dr. Fluke and never got it back. <laughs> <laughs> and so about 70 years ago, uh, Jewish people experienced brutal Holocaust directed by Nazi Germany in Europe. Uh, the human suffering of this magnitude is unbelievable. Today, the Holocaust uh, Center takes on the duty to spread the, the historical fact to current and next generations to educate them about the origin and the consequence of the Holocaust. I took Dr. Fluke's lecture uh, last summer when I attended a workshop, and uh, I vividly remember that he asked two girls to place their hands into two boxes and uh, take the objects out of the boxes. And I remember one of the objects was a, a refreshed white puppy, and another one was a black, uh, scared, frightened mouse. I think he uh, he wants to remind us the he wants to compare the innocent Jewish people to those cruel Nazi party, and that was the start uh, that sparked my interest in Holocaust. <coughs> I come from China, a country also suffered great loss, and many people died during the uh, 19th and 20th century by foreign invasions. And on December 7th, 1937, 1938, three, uh, the former China capital was invaded by Japanese, and 300, over 300,000 people were killed by Japanese soldiers during six weeks. So I. I do have strong feeling and curiosity uh, when, I hear, when I hear about anything that is related to Holocaust. Mr. Wolowski, uh, who's from Poland and uh, who's also a survivor who experienced the Holocaust, came to emigrate here in 1949, after, uh, five years later, after the war ended. And I interviewed him uh, last Sunday, and I had a deep talk with him. On um, December 1st, 1939, uh, Germans invaded Poland, and World War II officially started. And in 1940, uh, uh, Mr. Widowski and his family, uh, including his parents and four other siblings, were sent to a ghetto in Poland before, uh, in 1940, after uh, Poland was invaded by Germany. And after that, uh, he, was sent to Germ he was sent to Germany and experienced three different concentration camps. And finally, he was transferred to a death camp, uh, Auschwitz camp, which has come to symbolize the, the I'm sorry, 
which has to symbolize the Nazi killing machine in the public consciousness. By the way, in a recent study, I got that the, the figures of all ghettos, all uh, slave labor sites, concentration camps, and uh, killing factories have shocked even the scholars who steeped in the history of the Holocaust. There were 42,500 uh, killing machines during World War II in Europe. All right, so I, I know you have a lot to say about his story. What, what do you think that you'll remember the most from, from interviewing uh, Sam? Uh, I remember Sam had tears in his eyes when he was talking about the situation in the concentration camps, one of the concentration camps. He had to wake up at four in the morning and worked for, and worked for a whole day. And the food was considered for coffee, a muddy looking liquid, which always had a tar horrible taste. And no clothing provided. So it was that emotion that affected you to see him react like that after all these years? I, I could imagine. I could imagine the situation, the, the, the extremely harsh living environment. Yeah. What, about, what about you, Sam? What, do you, what will you remember from meeting with Ross? I remember. Yeah, with, from meeting with Ross, with having him interview you. I remember that he was very much interested in what happened. And I just saw him uh, for some way that some people left uh, in the beginning of the war. They went to uh, Shanghai and they were treated very good. But the one who, who remained there, we had a very tough time. Um, I was uh, uh, under the German occupation for five years, actually, from uh, September 1st, 1939, till about April 29, 1945. And it was very, very difficult. I wondered myself, how did I survive? My first time, which I recall, was actually um, uh, yesterday was the, the anniversary of 69 years, the revelation in Normandy. Maybe you saw this on this. And that time I suffered very much. I lost a brother, an account, he was involved in that situation also. And then after this, uh, we went, uh, we still remain in the ghetto for another month, till the last one. But the worst part of it, how I survived, I was wondering in myself, which was that they put us on the trains from the ghetto to Auschwitz. This was the voice. He was traveling a whole night, and in the morning they opened up the doors in the kettle, and People were standing outside and he, he commanded to the right and to the left. In that time they took away, not only in the minute, they took away my whole family. This is number one. But besides that, this was in the morning and they kept us, me and my brother, in an open field in a hot summer, but August 29, I think, more or less. That after the drop of water, a whole day, this was the worst thing which I experienced in my life. How did I survive? We were young, we were able to do it. Today, I wouldn't able, be able to do it, uh, to survive a half of it, but I survived that time. I'm grateful to Dr. Flo that she makes that program. I'm coming here to every meeting, and I interviewed already quite maybe a half a dozen days, and on top of it, Dr. Food, I, um, now it's the, the season is over, the school is over. I have a video, uh, a DVD, which I made for my grandchildren. They interviewed me, and I'm willing to bring this, and this, whenever you arrange this a whole class, let them see what I say, what I went through, and you can see me in person. Sam will do that. I want to tell you something about Sam coming to our Bagels and Talk program. Uh, Sam is sort of a newcomer. He came about three years ago. And when he came in, uh, he's sitting down. I, I remember the day because it, it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Sam, Sam walks in, and he gets a bagel and a cup of coffee, and he sits down. 
and I said I'd like to introduce a new member, Sam Wadarski, and the six women who were sitting there look at him and say, so where are you from? And he says, Poland. And he says, how old are you? And, he said, and they say, oh, a young one. <laughs> okay, so they're looking. Sam, thank you very, very much, both of you. My pleasure. Okay. okay, Sam, say okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Leroy, thank you. Thank you. I want to introduce someone who just came in, who joins us, who is fairly new to the program we're doing, but who really understands and has been involved in it. Uh, we have a, a newly elected assembly member, Neely Rosick, who uh, I think one of the first things I, s I met her at a meeting at Borough Hall and uh, she came up to me and said, uh, I want to come to the Holocaust Center. Let me come. And I'd like to introduce Assemblywoman Nilly Rosick. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Assemblywoman Nilly Rosick. Um, what Dr. Flew left out of that little conversation was my mom has been coming to the Holocaust Center probably every week since as long yeah. as I can remember. Right. She is deeply devoted to the center um, and it's such a great resource um, for the community. So I, I, once I got elected, I had to come and see it for myself in a different perspective. Um, as someone who grew up in a household deeply affected by the Holocaust and having a mother who worked at Yad Vashem and was always um, writing about the Holocaust, both in Hebrew and in English, um, this program is just that much more meaningful to me and to those that I serve in the State Assembly. Um, everyone can say that they've been affected in some way by genocide, both old and new, if you're young, if you're old. Um, and that's why this program is even that much more important because I've always been affected by the Holocaust. I studied it growing up, going to school. Um, but you have to think about those who just have never been experienced or have never uh, been enlightened about what happened um, you know, so many years ago. So I commend all of you for your dedication um, and for coming week after week and sharing your stories. I know how incredibly difficult it can be sometimes. But it's important um, that we share the stories and so that ne future generations never forget what happened and that we can prevent future atrocities. Um, I have certificates of merit for each one of you. So on behalf of Assemblyman Ed Bronstein and I, um, we are very proud and honored to be a part of this program with Queensborough, with Dr. Flug, and with my colleagues in government. So thank you all for being here. It's always a pleasure to be back. Okay, so um, our next intern is going to be Brandon Toey, and he interviewed Steve Berger. So Brandon is actually pre-med here at the, at the college, and I was intrigued with Brandon when I learned about his math and science background, because in a lot of ways it doesn't really connect, but, but he you know, proved that it would make sense. In his application, he mentioned how he didn't, you know, it would seem it wouldn't connect, but and he, to quote him, he said, it will help me achieve a more rounded education and help further the development of my skills in dealing with people on an individual basis. And then he said, I feel the medical field too often focuses on the patient's problems and not the patients themselves. So I was really impressed by that. And uh, I know that he'll be a great doctor for just going into it with that, with that wonderful um, background. So he was interested in the scope of the German takeover, so we decided to pair him with our survivor, Steve Berger. Hi, how are you? I don't remember writing that at <laughs> <laughs> But thank you, it sounds really great. Uh, so I interviewed Steve Berger, who grew up in Hungary. Um, he was about 16 when the Nazis invaded Hungary. Hungary had decided that it was going to try to ally with the Allies when they saw that Germany was going to lose the war. So because of that, Nazi Germany decided to invade and to hold on to Hungary. And I wasn't aware of this, but actually Hungary had been quite anti-Semitic before that, even before the Nazis came in. It wasn't necessarily as bad as mainland Germany and the, and the lands they had conquered until then, but it wasn't, it wasn't the way of life we're used to. It wasn't the way of life um, non-Jewish Hungarians were living. 
So Steve was finishing up, he was pre-engineering uh, in school when the Nazis invaded. Uh, immediately they started, they stripped the, all the Jewish Hungarians of all their citizen rights, had her start wearing the star, um, they were moved into a ghetto. And one of the things that struck me was just really how humble uh, Mr. Berger was about what he, what he did during, during that time. He, he just calmly told me him and th two friends escaped the ghetto, to, slept outside at night, went into town during the day, got food, hit again during the day and stuck back into the ghetto at night. And it, it just was, it wasn't bragging. It wasn't, it was just said casually, like I went to the store and picked up some milk. And it was, it was, re it's a really amazing what people can do under these circumstances. And, and, you know, you just do what you have to do. And that's, that's pretty much what really struck me with, with his story. It was just one thing after another, he just did what he had to do to survive and to protect his family. One of the, one of the really amazing aspects of the story is when after they had been um, put on trains to a concentration camp, civilians who were working with the Nazis needed engineers, or oh, I believe it was mechanics, needed mechanics. And as he was pre-engineering, he put his hand up, he said, I'm a mechanic. You know, he said, I, he figured he could go in there and, and they wouldn't kill him because they needed him. And an SS officer said, okay, get on the truck. And he's like, with, not without my, my mom and my sister. The guy puts his hand on his gun. And, and another thing that struck me was just the casual brutality, the dehumanization, dehumanization of Jewish people by, Germany, by the Germans and by anyone who wasn't Jewish at the time. This SS officer was completely willing to shoot Steve in the head because he wouldn't get on the truck when he told him because he wanted to bring his mom and his sister with him. And luckily, they needed him. So they took his, his mother and his sister with them, and, and he got to get them out of the, the, they didn't go to the concentration camp. They went to the factory, which had a little barracks in the back, and they stayed there throughout the war. And he worked in the factory, and, and it just, it's, what really struck me is I, I'm, particularly, I'm a particularly lucky person. Um, I almost died in a car accident when I was 16. I spent like seven months in the hospital, and, and that's something Steve had said about his story. He's just he was he's a very lucky person, and he and you can see he's grateful for it. And I'm grateful for the life that I can live after the, after I've gone through the things I've gone through. And it really it was really it's a sobering experience to hear someone because I can I can watch the documentaries, I can watch the miniseries Band of Brothers. I loved it. It was great, great. It was entertaining, but it's not real until someone says who's been through it gets tells you with the emotion and with the and just like letting you know what it was like to live during that time. I, I can't, I live a great life. I live in America in the, in the 19th and 20th century. I, I, I have absolutely nothing to complain about. And to hear this, it's, it's definitely something I'm gonna pass on. And, and I, I really, I really appreciate the fact that to, and the opportunity to, to hear his story and to learn more about the, the Holocaust. Because I grew up with the general knowledge of the Holocaust. I grew up in the American education system. I paid attention sometimes. So I, I remember <laughs> some of the stuff that they told me. But I, w I wasn't aware that Hungary was anti-Semitic even before the Nazis. I wasn't aware of the depth of the indoctrination of the children, which really led to like a lot of the fanaticism when it came to the anti-Semitism in Germany. And I I've really gotten a more rounded uh, education about it. And it, it. And another thing, you know, I know you had asked a couple of the uh, interns about what what really struck you. And this is something Steve had mentioned too. It's like which it's so easy to forget. It's so you know it's so easy to go back to the same. Um, what's the word I'm thinking about? The, the, I'm blanking on the word, but it, it's easy to go back to the same way of, of society that leads to this kind of atrocity. And it's, you know, I was sitting there, and I was listening to people, the interns speak and the survivors speak, and I was thinking it's so easy to just disregard a whole race of people, a whole subculture of people with, with one word or one phrase. And, and that's really like, that's the first step in, in genocide is to dehumanize people, like calling Jewish people rats back in the 1940s. You know, it's, it's take away the humanity because there's absolutely no way you could be that brutal if you, if you look at someone and see a human. I couldn't, I, I, I see humans, I couldn't just take my gun out and, and shoot someone right now or put someone in a camp that I know they're gonna starve and die. So it's really, I think that's the one message I got from Mr. Berger is to just be aware and don't let it ever happen again and just to remember. And I think that's the main thing about this internship. So. Thank you. Great. Steve? Very well done, uh, Brandon. You remembered everything I told you. <laughs> you see, when I, I uh, speak to students, 
I don't want them to feel that I want to tell them my story. I want them to feel that to learn from my experience. His story is very important because we learn so much from his story. And his story keeps repeating itself. Different people, different places, but essentially the same thing. Nobody came into my classroom to talk to me what could happen. That's why I'm coming to you here in your classrooms. I want you to learn from my experience. We live in a very dangerous world today. I don't have to tell you. All you have to do is just listen to the news every day. And seeing young people like Brandon learning from my experience, when I leave this world, I know I will leave the history in very good hands. Thank you. I want to be short. I'm not running for office. <laughs> Let me just get a photo of you because I know you said Steve had to go. You can stand. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Great. I know. You guys are coordinated. All right. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to call up uh, MD Bobby Islam, who's interviewed Jane Kaibel. So uh, Bobby is actually studying applied science and computer information systems here at the college. And he's from Bangladesh. And this semester was actually extremely significant for him in his study of the Holocaust because aside from participating in this internship, he was in a class this semester that took part in a service learning <coughs> project that collaborated with the Holocaust <coughs> Center. And in the project, they read a book called Parallel Journeys, which is a study of um, a Holocaust survivor and someone that was in the Hitler Youth. And in the project, students interviewed survivors in small groups and then wrote reaction papers to their experience. And in that project, he actually interviewed Hannah Deutsch. So I wanted him to interview somebody else to get a different, ch um, a chance to hear a different perspective. So we decided to pair him with, with Jane. Thank so, you. yes. All right. Thank you, Marissa. First of all, I want to say thank you, Dr. Arthur Flug and her, his thank staff, thank you. to give me this opportunity to meet with Jenny, who is one of the survivors, Uncle Survivor. So when I was met with Jenny, she told me her life story. She was born in uh, Imberfield, Germany. So her father has a departmental store. She had a nice family and they had a big apartment. And there is a big hallway, you can memorize it. <laughs> they play with her sister, and sometimes her cousin come to join with us to play soccer. You can imagine it, how big hallway it was. It. <laughs> but after Nazi come to the power in 1933, <coughs> his, her father, is do not allow to do the business and she could not go to school anymore. He get isolated from her school friends. So it was so miserable for her to exhibit as a teenager. So one time his her father decided to leave Europe. So his father was too strong and determined person. Do you have the, the letter that you wrote to her? Yes. 
Maybe I would love for you to maybe read that to her because I thought that was great. I don't have it. Oh, you don't have it with you? Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Well, so, you know, hearing Jane's story is a little bit unusual from some of the other survivors. What do you think you'll remember the most about meeting firsthand with a survivor? Uh, yeah, uh, when they was living in Germany, he had a grandmother. He was too old and blind person. Right. So they have only four visa, one for her, one for her sister, and <coughs> parents for two. But she couldn't come with them. It was so miserable. And so you remember how her, her yeah. grandmother couldn't come yeah, because yes. she was blind and, and too old. Uh, yeah. um, well, so Jane, what was it like being interviewed by Bobby? Because he has a unique perspective as well. Yeah, it was a very interesting young man. I enjoyed him. Uh, we had a little difficulty sometimes understanding each other. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he managed, right? <laughs> but what he didn't say that uh, my experience was a little different from the rest of the people like in concentration camps. I was never in a concentration camp. And uh, I think I pointed that out to you. And I was on the ship St. Louis, remember? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And that wasn't a large land in Cuba, and we had to go back to Europe. So that was the difference between almost anybody else here who was in a concentration camp. Yeah, great. Is there anything else you want to say? Okay, wonderful. Yeah. All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do Shira. All right, so our next intern is, uh, is Shira. I'm going to see if you stand, okay. Oh, I thought, is Shira Calker. Um, unfortunately, her, the person she interviewed wasn't able to be here, but, um, so we're going to have her go up by herself. So Shira is studying criminal justice here at the college. And Shira actually lived in, in Israel for five years, where she worked at Yad Vashem and got to interview many Holocaust survivors. So she came to this internship with a very unique perspective because of that. Many f people in her family are Holocaust survivors, inc including her grandmother. So since interviewing survivors isn't a new experience for her, I wanted to try and do something a little bit different. So I asked her to interview Daniel Brooks, who's the founder of 3G NYC, which is a third generation Holocaust survivor uh, support group. So it's the grandchildren of survivors. And my hope was that she might in turn look at her own experience a little bit differently as that of a survivor, which I don't know if when you came into it, you were thinking of yourself like that. So I'd be really curious to hear how it went. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so I actually volunteered Yad Vashem for numerous years when I was living in Israel. So I do have a lot of experience talking to survivors. Um, I interviewed Daniel Brooks, who founded a, it, it started off as a support group, but now they're, they also have an educational aspect to it. They go into public schools or any school that needs to talk about the Holocaust, and they bring in different stories, and they try to focus more on what that specific school problem is so for instance they go into schools in the city and they have a problem with bullying so they try to compare how the Holocaust you know was against uh, you know Jews or other people that weren't just like they wanted and they try to talk about how people don't realize bullying is also something that's a big issue now so they bring that in a lot um, he actually started this group in I believe it was 2005 he was sitting at a round table discussion with a bunch of other survivors. Well, they weren't survivors, they were third generation descendants. Um, their grandparents had gone through the Holocaust. And he decided, you know, this is a really good opportunity to start a program, like a group, that would be able to meet and talk about their grandparents so that they're able to preserve their grandparents' story. So most of the people in the group are a lot older than I am. So their grand a lot of their grandparents have already passed away. Um, I'm actually fortunate enough my grandmother is still alive and she is a Holocaust survivor. She, when I was younger, she didn't like to talk about the Holocaust um, at all. So up until maybe two years ago, I did not know her story. I, there are still parts of her story that I don't, that I don't know fully, but um, about two years ago, I think my brother, my younger brother, needed to do a project and he asked, like, I don't know, out of the blue, he just called my grandmother and said, you have to tell me your story. So he actually got the whole story and 
after talking to Daniel Brooks, I decided that I think that I need to go and sit down with my grandmother and record her and understand her story so that this way I could pass it on since it's very close with me. It's my grandmother. My grandfather also survived the Holocaust, but unfortunately he died like 20 years before I was born. So I actually don't know his story, but my father said that he's going to sit down and tell me. So interviewing him, I realized how important it is to actually listen to people's stories and how important it is to sit down with people and get the full story because like, for instance, last week in class, my professor asked a question. She said, what was one of the biggest things in history that happened that killed off a big race of people? And people just sat there. No one could think of anything. The Crusades, the Holocaust, nothing. Everyone just sat there. And then the professor looks at me and she says, okay, I see, that. I see you have an answer. Like, what is it? So I said, the Holocaust. And people looked at me and asked, what's the Holocaust? So after I realized that, I decided that I think that people really need to have more knowledge on the fact that there was a Holocaust. But I, I personally, I don't understand how people never heard of the Holocaust, but I guess I grew up going to yeshiva, so I learned that as a kid. But um, this really opened my eyes to see that people need to be more aware. So this program is great. And I told people, I actually sent people to my class, and I told them to come to the Holocaust Museum and check it out and learn about different genocides. So hopefully they're going to come do that. <laughs> so did this change? the idea of the term survivor for you at all? Um, it did, because you, pe most people think the Holocaust survivor is just a survivor. It's the person who actually went through the experience. And, and that's true, except that I think that also, you know, the children of those people or the grandchildren or even um, great-grandchildren, they're also, they're survivors because, you know, if my grandmother and my grandfather didn't survive, I would not be able to sit here today and talk to you because, you know, Technically, I also survived, I mean, through my grandmother. So, yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. So, our next intern is going to be Rong Ling Kiki. Um, she interviewed Anita Weisberg, who also unfortunately couldn't be here. She is, uh, she's away. So, Kiki is studying pre nursing here at the college. And in her application, for the internship, she said how she liked to read and she liked to learn things that she could relate to her daily life. And she only learned about the Holocaust in the last two years. She heard a survivor speak about their experience during World War II and she was really moved by their story. So we decided to pair her with uh, survivor Anita Weisberg. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit of what it was like interviewing her? Yeah. Um, like the first time that I heard about the Holocaust, it's in my high school years. and. One, at that time, I'm in my English class, and there's a book called Holocaust. And then I asked my teacher what, what is Holocaust, and then she told me that some background information about it. And then not long ago, there's a survivor who came to my school library. That time, I'm so excited to meet her because I feel like I'm going to meet someone who just came from history. So I'm so happy, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm so happy that I have this opportunity to join this pro, this internship to learn more about Holocaust. Um, as I interview with Antina, I, I feel that her, the deep love that her mom has for her, because I, at the time when her mom tried to send her away to England, like her aunt was complaining about it because I, her, her aunt feel like it's unbelievable for her mom to send her children away to a country that they are not familiar with. So they argue a lot. Right, so Anita was on the kinder transport. So, uh, so yeah, so there was that struggle between her, her mother and her siblings asking how could, they, how could she send her daughter away. But that's what saved her, right? Yeah. But when she was sent to England, that like she was on the train with all other like little children and people around the age of like seventeen and younger. But at the time, she was like sitting near the win near the window around the train state where the train is. Like she was looking out at the window, like she's like. She, when she would look out the window, she was so afraid that when she leave, she would not be able to see her parents again. 
because like, the chance to see her parents is like it's unpredictable that they were going to meet again in the future. And she was just like crying and she just don't want to leave. Like, she keeps like looking out at the window until the train starts to part to take part. Mm. So what do you think you'll remember the most about about her story and about just getting to sit down and, and talk with her? One thing that I like what she says is that she believed her mother gave her birth give to her birth choice. One is when she was born and another one is when her mom sent her away to England to start a new life. That's the time where she when she went to England she met her her husband and then they get married in here. Yeah, also her husband hope are pursuing American dream brought them to the United States in nineteen forty seven and her children and grandchildren were all raised in America. One thing that I learned from one of the lessons that I get from interviewing her is that no matter what things that our parents do to us or what they say to us, it's always even though sometimes it can hurt us, but it's always for our own good. Oh, that's great. Great. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, all right. So next, we're going to have Dorothy. So um, she interviewed Ethel. Yes. OK, so Dorothy is studying um, health, health sciences here. No? Yeah. <laughs> Great. So Dorothy is an international student at the college, and she came from Guyana. And uh, I was particularly taken with her application to the program because she, she stressed how important it was for her to learn about the, the Holocaust as an international student so that she could help to educate others. And she expressed, when I interviewed her later, a really deep interest for the, 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 the people aspect of the survivor, how people felt. So we decided to pair her with, with Ethel. Hi. It has been a very great opportunity for me to be part of this memorable internship. And I thank Dr. Fluke and Miss Marisa for giving me this um, opportunity to do the internship. Um, like she said, I'm an international student from Ghana, and I heard about the World War, but not the Holocaust. I just heard about the Holocaust when I came to the school. So I took interest in it and wanted to be part of the internship. And fortunately for me, I had a chance to interview one of the survivors. And it was very memorable because I never thought such cruelty could happen to human beings by other human beings. I was so touched by her story. Um, Ethel Kim is from Pusach, yeah. right? <laughs> A town in eastern Poland. And she had seven members in her family. But unfortunately, her mother died before the Holocaust. She had a twin brother, her father, an elder sister, and another set of twin brothers, right? And everything changed for the family when Hitler came into power. And she said, Hitler's army marched to her town in July 5, 1941. In the first three days they came into the town, 100 Jews were killed. And in August, um, Jewish men of the educated class were all guarded, and that included her twin brother. They, they were all gunned down. None of them returned home. And I don't know. I don't know how I felt to lose like a sibling, not to talk about a twin. And it was so traumatizing. And she told me how her family had to flee to live in the bushes. They had to live in trees. Like they had, and unfortunately for them, they came by an abandoned house, so they moved into that house. And for for a moment, like they had a peace of mind because it was snowing, so like nobody came to disturb them, but. One time they were in the house when they heard airplanes hovering 
around the home. So she told me like <laughs> her brothers were happy. They thought like everything was over. And they were happy. They thought they were going to school. She said one of her twin brothers said she, all he wanted to have one loaf of bread all to himself because <laughs> they were not eating. They had um, one, two friends of her dad. They were Russians who usually sneaked to the house and brought them food. So they were not like eating regularly. But they were thinking everything was over, but it wasn't. They were surrounded by soldiers. And she said her father asked all of them to go um, run to the back of the house and run through the window. They had nowhere to go, but the father told them, run, just run. And they had no idea, but they, they just had to <coughs> run. And she said she didn't remember anything again. She was hit at the back of her head and she collapsed. And when she woke up, she saw all, all of her family were gunned down. They were all killed. She was rescued by two Polish um, young men who came to her aid and helped her bury um, her family. And that I think I couldn't even take it. Burying the whole of your family just in one day by yourself. She's, she's such a strong woman. I can't imagine. I can't imagine she went through all that. So that, I mean, it's a very intense story. Yeah. What, what do you think that you'll, you'll take away from it? You know, aside from, from all the tragedy she experienced. She, 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 she has taught me to like, pick yourself up anytime you have a problem and just pick yourself up and move on in life. She's, she's not an author. And through all that, she lost all her family. She came to the United States and remarried, had new family, and now she's moving on with her life. And she wants the world to know what happens to her family and all the other Jews that suffered from. <laughs> <laughs> Ethel, you want to add something to yeah. me? Ethel, would you like to say anything about your experience with Dorothy? I thank her very much. I appreciate that she gave me full attention. She absorbed the whole story, and I am <clears throat> grateful she knows it, and she will preserve that history, what happened to me. I am very grateful, because the Holocaust is mostly people hear about the guest chambers. Six million Jews died. Five million died in the guest chambers. I am talking, my history is about the one million Jews who died outside the camps. We were suffering, we were starved, we were beaten, we were tortured by hunger and thirst and fear, and fear was killing us. And this I'll never forget that after all the suffering, hiding for two years in the cellars and the, in, in the cellars and attics, all over, eventually all the suffering, and we were murdered. The, in the camps was the gas chambers, and we, had, we didn't have the Gestapo on our necks for 24 hours in the camps they did. But the fear was with us 24 hours, and that was what killed us. Thank you very much Thank you. for your attention and for carrying down the lecture. Okay, so next, we're gonna have Ben and Hannah. So, uh, Ben is studying music here at QCC, and he was a huge asset to this internship program <coughs> because he came with an extensive knowledge of the Holocaust and of Judaism in general. Not only did he go to a Zionist sleepaway camp, he visited the Holocaust Museum in DC, and while he was there, he lobbied about the genocide in Darfur. 
he was in B'nai B'rith, he's been to Vad Vashem, and I think he got a great, a great perspective to the group, and he definitely had a lot to say in a very good way. And uh, he was also offered a very competitive internship this summer in DC, so we're really proud of him for that. And he expressed an interest in interviewing a survivor that was a fighter. So we decided to pair him with Hannah Deutsch. Okay. Thank you, Marissa. Um, first off, I want to thank Marissa for pairing me with Hannah. She's an amazing woman, and I'll explain that throughout this, this, uh, this little panel here. Um, as Marissa stated, um, um, first I want to go into my, my background a little bit. As an American Jew, uh, the Holocaust has been involved uh, learning about it in every facet of my life, uh, whether it be at a public school history class, at my temple where a survivor came to speak to the group, or even as a counselor at the Zionist camp, uh, Young J.S. Sprout Lake, uh, where I'd be creating lesson plans for those campers. Each time I always had a similar reaction. I was in tears. I, I usually don't cry, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a big crier, but when I learn about the Holocaust, I'm usually very, you know, it's, I'm overcome with emotions. Um, finally, uh, after years of learning about the Holocaust, I finally got to interview a survivor. And prior to the interview, I assumed my reaction would be exactly the same, that I would be in tears after the interview. Um, however, this was not the case, and not because what happened wasn't said, but because I had so much respect and so, and I was in awe of Hannah. Um, she she was not sent to a concentration camp, um, but however, she was on the Kinder Transport, which for those of you who don't know, uh, this is a movement that moved children from Germany to Britain. Uh, most countries weren't letting Jews in, and Britain allowed those those a certain group of children to leave leave Germany. Um, but the problem was some children didn't have a place to go. Some children were stuck with foster parents or in orphanages. Uh, this journey alo alone is hard enough, but on the way to Britain, Hannah took care of the children. She, she was 16. She was older than most children on the, on, the, on the trains and the ships, and she took care of those children on, on the boat. Um, on top of this, uh, when she arrived in Britain, she studied nursing, which on, its, on, on its own is an amazing feat. Um, however, she took that nursing ability and joined the army. For the country that saved her, she was now going to help save it. Um, with all she already had to deal, deal with, she had more altruism and has a bigger heart than I personally have seen. Um, yes, to be honest, I could I could cry because I don't know how strong I would be in this situation. I, even after learning about the Holocaust, I, I'm still in, I'm still very, I get more hurt than anything just hearing certain things. However, seeing how, how Hannah took this <clears throat> and used it to do good and help children to, and serve the military for her country, that saved her. There's no, as I said, there's no truer kindness and I don't have more respect for any, any one person, at least at this point in my life. Hannah, you are an amazing person, and I wish I, I had your strength. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to hear everything I have learned, to, to hear, hear your story, I apologize. I know I will never forget, as uh, the, the famous quote, um, and when I, when I speak of the Holocaust, along with everything I have learned, I will speak of your strength and, and share your story to show that even when the world could be at its harshest point. People can still rise above. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah, would you like to say anything about your experience with Ben? I spent two wonderful hours with Benjamin. It took me that long to get through my life. But this, he is my fourth or fifth intern. And I speak in many places, in schools, colleges, in, in organizations, in synagogues. And I talk about this program and how wonderful this is. And I think a lot of my requests for speeches come from this. But most of all, I tell them in the end, 
You see, when I'm not anymore, then I'm still here because I have all these students that talk about my life. So thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> thank you guys, wonderful. All right, so we're up to our last intern, Lita. So, um, unfortunately, Lena Survivor couldn't be here today, um, Lena Gorin, but uh, so Lita's studying business administration and marketing. And one thing that caught my attention in Lita's application to the internship program was that she described herself as a future entrepreneur. So I really loved that. And with this goal in mind, she, she recognized that interacting directly with survivors would bring her a new perspective that would be useful in her future career. And she was a member of the Air Force Junior Reserves. Uh, junior ROTC. Okay, yeah, this is amazing. And she has a lot of personality. So I knew that I had to pair her with Lena Gorin because for any of you that have met that survivor, she has a lot of personality too. And I'm disappointed she couldn't be here, but I'm excited to hear about um, your experience with her. Hi everyone, my name is Lena Ramos. Um, I had the honor of interviewing Mrs. Lena Casuto Gorin. Um, for any of you know, that know Lena, and she like, Melissa says she has a lot of personality. She, the best way I can describe her is she has <laughs> the mind of a 20 year old stuck in an 80 year old body. She is <laughs> amazing. She, um, I went to speak to her in her house and she spoke to me about uh, her experience of the Holocaust in Greece which is very unique because not a lot of people know that the Holocaust also occurred in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, her hometown was uh, Larissa, and she told me about her story. Um, her and her family were lucky enough to escape her hometown in time. Unfortunately, the rest of her family didn't. Uh, she lost all her aunts, her uncles, her grandparents, her cousins. The only people that survived um, were herself, her mother, her father, and her brother and her sister. Um, they hid in many places. Um, she was around 10 years old when the war started, which is very young, so she had to grow up at a very young age. She was forced to. She always lived in fear. Uh, her father was a rabbi, which was a comfort for her, and he was very brave because when they had left their hometown, um, when he got the notice from the mayor telling him in advance <coughs> that you should leave because um, they were going to start rounding up all the Jews, deport them. Uh, he managed to grab 15 families with him, around 80 people, and he saved most of them. They traveled, um, they hid him. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was very interesting uh, speaking with her. She, um, she's a very strong-minded person, very strong-minded. Um, I just hope that when I'm her age, I will still be that way. Um, the thing that most uh, that most affected me, I guess the thing I will remember most about speaking with her, um, she told me three words that I will never forget. She said three words that you should pass on to the children and that will help you get through life will be strength, uh, willingness, and determination. I'm sorry, courage, willingness, and determination. Uh, courage to uh, you know, follow your dreams, courage to keep doing what you're doing. You need the willingness to do it because if you don't want to do it, you're not going to accomplish it. You need determination as well. That was very inspiring to me. Um, after she told me her story, we spent a lot of time. I spent around three hours <laughs> with her because we were just talking. I felt like I was talking with my girlfriend because <laughs> she does so many hobbies now. She sings. She sang for me, which was so beautiful. She has. She's been doing shows this whole week, which is amazing. Um, she sews, she took out all her dresses and all the, co not costumes, but all the dresses and the wardrobe she oh, makes herself. Which are she's not shy. Beautiful, no. <laughs> she showed me pictures of her wedding and her children and I'm just, this woman has accomplished so much after, um, after going through something so horrible. And I look up to her very well, um, a lot. And I didn't write uh, a response paper but I did um, a painting that I thought I'd bring in to show you. I'm not an artist, <laughs> I'll tell you right now. 
So I, but I did try my best, and I, I wanted to show you guys. Unfortunately, she's not here, but I am gonna stop later on and show it to her. From the rain, huh? Yeah, it was raining really hard. Don't laugh. <laughs> okay. Oh, beautiful. So, what does this represent? Thank you. Um, well, I drew a tree because um, <laughs> I guess meaning sort of the tree of life. Um, I drew the tree, I painted the tree um, really big and really thick because, I, like the roots, because I feel like um, what I learned from her, you know, never forget where you came from, your roots. She's very, very, she loves her family so much and she, I can tell, and that really, um, I try to show that. Um, I don't know if you can see, but on this part of the tree, I chose soft colors because when she was um, young, when the war started, which was around 10, 13 years old, so soft colors <coughs> would indicate her innocence when she didn't know what was about to happen. Um, the middle, I chose gray and dark blue and black because that was the period that her family went through from 1940 to 1945, what she suffered through. And then the last, I chose really bright, um, out colors because that's the way she lived her life after, after um, the Holocaust. You know, she she lived her life fully. She did everything she wanted to do. She accomplished her all her goals. You know, she never let anyone tell her she couldn't do anything. She and she's still doing it now. <laughs> so I'm very uh, proud of her. So yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It couldn't have been timed better because last week a young man who was an intern in our program last semester comes in and he says, you remember me? I said, yes. He said, my survivor was Mr. Sam, meaning Sam Wadowski. He referred to him as Mr. Sam. And the young man is an art major. He said, could you give this to him? I listened to his story and I drew a picture of what I thought he looked like with a concentration camp uniform on. So, Sam, this is, this is, this is something for good. Okay. Have we done our last turn? Now, one thing now, what I'd like you to do is I'd like all the survivors and their interns to come up front. Just come up front, please. And Jocelyn, would you join us? Yes, right in the front. I want you to stand by your survivor. And I want you to look at your survivor. This is very important. I want you to take your survivor by the hand. And if they're not there, do it in your mind. And I want you to say to your survivor, I will never forget you. I will remember you forever. I will tell your story to whoever I can. And I thank you for the opportunity of being with you. Thank you.